Hi, I'm Kathy and I live in Calgary. My husband was diagnosed 12 years ago with Parkinson's. When Vern was diagnosed, he came home and sat on the couch and was terribly depressed because to him, he was in a wheelchair and that meant our lives and my life would be over. But he took all of it at once instead of Parkinson's is progressive. And so it took him a while to realize that this was not going to happen overnight or next week or a month later. So it changed our lives a lot in how we approached it. For me, it's been a scenario of he's not the person I used to know. And someone explained to me once when I was dealing with my father and his dementia was, this is the person he was. Now this is the person he is. And I have to constantly say to myself, this is who he is today. And it's, you do grieve, you grieve who he was. But this, so that's the, the hard thing is to keep saying, this is where we're at. When he started on the Cinemat, within two months, he had no tremors, he walked normal, had a fit. He, no one knew he had Parkinson's for six months. There were no outside signs. There weren't even signs at home. He could do all the things he did before the diagnosis. There wasn't anything that showed up as Parkinson's. But in 2016, he hit the wall and everything showed up. Parkinson's progresses constantly with plateaus. So there never seems, you never be able to go back once you slide into a new plateau, there isn't really a chance to recover back. People ask or mention to Vern, well, why can't you move faster? Why are you slow? Why do your arms move slow? Why do you walk slow? A lot of Parkinson's is hidden. The small cognitive things, the small different movements, you would just see a person that walked very slowly, a uh, hard time maneuvering, freezing, standing in one spot and not moving. You would also see a person that looked like they moved in slow motion. Everything they do is slow. And the analogy is if you were in a swimming pool and you had a walker, or even if somebody was trying to chase you, how fast could you run? Can you run in a swimming pool? Can you move your arms? Can you push something? And if somebody pushes you, you tend to fall over in a pool. You can't stand up. And that's what it feels like to him. It feels like his whole body is dragging through the air. We've known other people who just wait nine, 10 months before they even see a neurologist. And that I think people need to understand that if it is Parkinson's, the sooner you have intervention, the better it is. It's scary and it's overwhelming and that's okay. Hello everyone and welcome to the final week of Parkinson Awareness Month and our Lunch and Learn series. We would like to thank our sponsor this week, the Brain Canada Foundation. As you know by now, our focus this month is on hope through research as we continue to raise awareness of the importance of the research community uh, that the research community has on our Parkinson's community. Support for Parkinson's disease research in Alberta is extremely important. Alberta has so much to offer in the effort to improve lives and progress to a cure for people living with PD. With exceptional institutions and highly regarded investigators. Research is hope, hope for a better life and in hopefully not too distant future, a cure. Our work would not be possible without the generosity of our community. And thanks to a member of our community, Mr. Roger Dudson, for all, don all donations through the 
end of April for Parkinson research will be matched. So your investment will have double the impact. Thank you to Roger and his family, as well as our donors for your amazing generosity. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them in the chat box below. At the bottom of your screen, there is a chat blurb icon. Click it and the chat will appear on the right hand side. After our presentations today, we will answer as many questions as we can, um, though we may not get to all of them. This webinar will be recorded. All information provided in the video by Parkinson Association and the featured speakers is furnished strictly for educational and entertainment purposes only. This service is not intended to be diagnostic, prescriptive, or replace the relationship advice and or care of your physicians. General questions about symptoms, treatments, available medications, complementary therapies, research, and alternative healthcare therapies will be fielded. We have two presenters today, Dr. Veronica Bruno, MD, MPH, and Raylan Brassard, a PhD candidate in the lab of Dr. Joanne Lemieux at the University of Alberta. Our moderator today is Dr. David Martino, MD. Dr. Martino is an associate professor and the director of the Movement Disorders Program at the Hotchkiss Brain Institute at U of C. His research focuses on biological markers, environmental factors, and multidisciplinary pathways of care for complex movement disorders, mainly dystonia, Tourette syndrome, Parkinson's disease, and essential tremor. Welcome, Dr. Martino. Thank you very much, Declan, and, uh, and thank you to thank you to Parkinson's uh, Alberta for organizing this uh, very interesting webinar, and uh, which uh, uh, really gives us the. Uh, opportunity to showcase some of the excellent uh, clinical research and clinical and non-clinical research work that is happening in our province. Um, and um, it really gives me a particular uh, privilege to be able to introduce our two presenters today, um, which I would really like to uh, uh, start listening to uh, without further ado. And for this, I will then uh, therefore, introduce, first of all, our first speaker and presenter today, who is Dr. Veronica Bruno. Um, Dr. Veronica Bruno is a neurologist and a movement disorder specialist at the University of Calgary uh, in the Movement Disorders Clinical Program. Uh, she has received her medical degree and her, uh, completed her neurology residency in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. And she completed also her fellowship in movement disorders in, uh, at the University of Toronto and a Master of Public Health um, at uh, Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Bruno's primary interest is uh, treating advanced Parkinson's disease with a special research interest in pain and other non-motor symptoms like sexual dysfunction, depression, and anxiety. Uh, and she is also very interested in care partners' health I should say that uh, Dr. Veronica Bruno is a dear colleague and friend. I've, I've met very few colleagues uh, uh, so far who are as dedicated and focused on improving the quality of life and the well-being of people living with Parkinson's disease like Dr. Bruno. Uh, and I feel privileged working with her in our movement disorders program in Calgary. So her presentation today is on understanding pain and related symptoms in Parkinson's disease. And... Uh, uh, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, Veronica. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this nice introduction. I will open my screen and hope this will work well. And let me just uh, let me put this as a presenter. Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, Parkinson's Association of Alberta for this amazing invitation and for all the different activities that were held during um, this uh, important month for everyone working or suffering with or living with Parkinson's disease. Um, thank you, Dr. Martina, for this nice introduction. And it is my pleasure um, today to introduce some of the research that we are doing here in Calgary. Um, as Dr. Martino mentioned, I'm a neurologist and movement disorder specialist, but I also dedicate a lot of my time to work in research. And basically what I do is clinical research. Clinical research means that 
I try to learn from my patients, hear to their concerns, to their questions, and then try to understand those problems a bit more in order to be able to provide some answers and help and make their life uh, better. Um, so I have um, called this uh, presentation the unseen because as you saw in the video, this is a common thing, those hidden symptoms in Parkinson's disease, those that we are not usually used to read about or learn about. And I will speak a bit about what we are trying to do to make uh, the understanding of these hidden symptoms a bit uh, much better. So um, as a start, I will um, start uh, taking this opportunity to recognize that my work takes place on historical and contemporary indigenous lands, including the territories of treaties 6, 7, and 8, and the homeland of the Metis. And I also acknowledge the many indigenous communities that have been forged in urban centers across Alberta. Part of my interest, as I mentioned, is, is in what we call the non-motor aspects of Parkinson's disease. Um, as you know very well, Parkinson's has motor symptoms like the stiffness, the slowness, the tremor, um, sometimes walking problems and balance issues. But there is a list of non-motor symptoms that are also part of the disease. Some are more known than others. People know that there may be some depression, some anxiety associated with Parkinson's Parkinson's, that there are some times patients can develop uh, cognitive issues um, or constipation or low blood pressure, but that's not it. There is a longer list. And sometimes we cannot really approach all these problems in a regular visit. So for many patients, it remains unclear if those symptoms are related with the disease or not. Uh, so uh, my research program, uh, and in conjunction with a big team, um, we are working on trying to um, to make those uh, problems, uh, people more aware of those problems, and pain is one of those. Pain is not a thing that happens only in Parkinson's disease, but ha happens in all movement disorders. And even if my main research focuses on pain in Parkinson's disease, we are conducting studies in other disorders, such as atypical Parkinsonian syndromes um, that many uh, of you may be diagnosed with too. So I will start introducing you to the little, to the little by little, to the projects that we are running. Everything starts with the disease, the 205-year-old disease uh, that has been described initially with eight cases by James Parkinson's. And what is interesting about this is that if you go to the original essay where James Parkinson's described Parkinson's disease, he speaks about pain a lot. Um, however, for many years, the full like, medical community kind of forgot about this, or because patients with Parkinson's can have, of course, as many other people, um, pain due to other conditions, let's say osteoarthritis, it was always thought that pain was not really part of Parkinson's. The truth is that we know that that's not the case, and in fact, Parkinson's disease can hurt. And it's important for us to understand why to be able to treat that symptom that is so frequent and so disabling. So Parkinson's disease is extremely frequent. And as you know, we have all our hope in finding treatments to cure the disease, but still we don't have those treatments available. So every day, many people are diagnosed with Parkinson's and need to live with it. And we need to help them go through this. Uh, it's going to become even more frequent in the coming years, so we need to be prepared uh, for more patients being diagnosed and uh, having strategies to, to deal with the symptoms. As mentioned before, the, in the early stages, levodopat can help a lot. Other medications can also help reduce the symptoms significantly, but as the disease progresses, the non-motor symptoms that I mentioned before start to become more prominent, and this includes sometimes changes in cognition, changes in mood, sleep disturbances, sometimes low blood pressure, constipation, urinary frequency, and pain is one of those. What is interesting is that these symptoms make the management of the disease a bit more complex and seem to have a more significant impact on quality of life than the motor symptoms themselves. Pain 
can affect up to to eight eighty percent of patients with Parkinson's disease in different stages uh, of the disorder. And what is interesting that when people are asked about pain and can describe pain, it seems to be one of the main causes of disability and reduced quality of life. And paradoxically, as I mentioned, it has not been recognized as part of the symptom for many years. So many people are not receiving treatment for this particular aspect of the disease. And is, pain is a symptom that can present in multiple different ways. Um, we have one particular classification that we're using mostly these days. Um, and the pain can be like maybe mainly in the joints, like around your hips, around the shoulders, around your knees. It can also be a pain that is difficult to describe, that is deep within the body, um, that doesn't have a particular localization. It can be around some um, like, vis like visceral pain, like around your stomach or your bowels or your liver. It can be in a nerve distribution, like a sciatic nerve pain. But it's also very important to recognize a pain that is more classical for Parkinson's, that is what we call a fluctuation-related pain. And you may be familiar with this if sometimes when your medications are working well and you're in a numb period, you're not experiencing any pain. But as soon as the medication starts wearing off and you start to notice a bit more stiffness and slowness or the tremor reemerges, you notice that it's painful and that the shoulder or the arm or the leg start to hurt. That fluctuation related pain can be disabling and can be the more, more important, most important component of the off periods. Particularly, one type of pain that we see a lot during off times is a pain that is called dystonic pain in the foot, where toes turn to curl and the foot tends to twist inside of it. And that can be very painful and sometimes wake uh, people with Parkinson's up at night. This kinesia can be painful sometimes. It's not common, but can happen. And some patients also notice other types of pain, like pain in the shawl or oromandibular area, or pain at night in the legs that makes them very uncomfortable turning in bed, or even makes them need to move the legs at night. So what we are trying to do, as I mentioned, is to get a better understanding of that pain in Parkinson's. So the first thing that we are doing is trying to meet all the patients in Calgary that have Parkinson's disease and are experiencing some type of pain to get to understand the clinical and epidemiological characteristics of that pain in our community. So uh, since we have started, we have recruited, that number is not updated because now we have 80, 80 participants all with Parkinson's disease experiencing some type of pain. And this is a very preliminary number because we didn't uh, start analyzing the data, but I wanted to show you a general picture of what our people are suffering. And many people have pain around the joints. Many people are having pain whenever the medication is off. And also many people are reporting their pain or this type of pain inside deep within the body that is hard to describe. As part of the study, we are also asking about other characteristics of the pain. Uh, we want to qualitatively understand what each one of our patients is experiencing so we can try to target treatments and improve each particular patient quality of life. So we have an interview where we can chat about your particular type of pain if you are one of the people with Parkinson's living with this symptom. We're also with um, the collaboration of many basic, excellent basic scientists in our university trying to understand pain in Parkinson's at a very basic level with animal models. So we have a team of excellent basic scientists, researchers in uh, movement disorders, but also in pain that are working together, um, helping me understand pain in Parkinson's disease models with different rats and mice models to try to understand and also uh, to try to select what the best model to study pain in Parkinson's is. And the goal of this study is particularly um, being able to try 
therapeutic approaches before starting to try them in patients. So uh, we can make sure that we are using useful uh, drugs or interventions, and also that they are safe to use. In parallel with all these, we are conducting some clinical trials to try to directly and right now help our patients. What we are doing, uh, we started with Dr. Karnik that you had the opportunity to meet uh, this month, early this month. We went through everything that was available in terms of literature about potential treatments to help our patients with Parkinson's and pain, and would found that there was not a lot of information out there and the options are very limited. So we are right, right now uh, running two different clinical trials. One is for that foot dystonia or foot cramping that uh, can affect patients when they are off their medications and is using botulinum toxin type A. And the other one is using the dopamine agonist, the medication that works in the dopamine receptors for this fluctuation pain that comes up and down as, uh, when the medications are on or off. In terms of the first clinical trial, um, this was a result or the, the it is like the following up of a study of two studies that I conducted during my training in Toronto, showing that many patients with Parkinson's and atypical Parkinsonian syndromes benefit from botulinum toxin injections for different indications. After that, we try botulinum toxin for pain in Parkinson's in a small group of patients. And what we found was that most of the patients with the cramping on the foot notice a significant benefit for the treatment. So what we are doing now is a randomized placebo controlled trial with a bigger sample size. This means more patients being included in the study to show evidence about how useful this is for patients with Parkinson's disease. The treatment with botulinum toxin is um, a treatment, botulinum toxin is a very strong muscle relaxant that has the benefit of working locally in the muscles without producing side effects in any other part of the body. So when we inject with a small needle, a small dose in the muscles of the foot that are contracted all the time and are producing the pain, we can uh, relax those muscles, reducing the pain, reducing the curling and the twisting of the foot and reducing um, all the discomfort associated with those symptoms. The study is also designed with a follow-up uh, with an open label phase of the clinical trial. What basically this means that is that patients that uh, receive blindly or placebo or botulinum toxin during the first half, all of them will receive the real treatment by the end of the study. So for sure we will know if this particular treatment is good for this particular patient and we can work on continuing with that treatment afterwards if it provides a benefit. The second study that I mentioned for this pain that may come when patients are off, whenever the medications are not working, is using a medication that was a few years ago approved in Canada that is called apomorphine. Apomorphine is not related with morphine. It just had a name that sounds similar, but it's a dopamine agonist. It's a medication that works in dopamine receptors. But has some particular characteristics and basically it works very quickly. We can, um, in, the, in this study, we're trying a subcutaneous form of the disease with a small needle. Uh, we inject it in the subcutaneous tissue, like under the skin. And we are, even if we know that this is the medication that helps Parkinson's motor symptoms in general, we're trying to understand also and when we compare it with placebo, if it can also help that pain that affects some patients when they are in their off periods. Another uh, important aspect of our uh, research is really understand pain, not just treat it, not just find a good animal model, not just knowing what our patients express, but getting to look inside the brain and see which areas of the brain are the ones that are active when a patient with Parkinson's is suffering pain. 
So we are working on a protocol to uh, basically look into patients that have Parkinson's and have a non have pain, compare those brains and try to understand what is the difference and which areas of the brain are involved. So by the end of all this process, we can close this cycle. The goal of my research is starting talking with my patients, learning from their types of pain, understanding which areas of the brain are affected, seeing if there is any genetic or other factor that could be affecting that pain, develop strat strategies and medications or different treatments that could help, try those in a good optimal animal model, finally pre preparing a good treatment that will go back to my patients to improve their quality of life. There are other hidden symptoms in Parkinson's disease. It's not about pain only. It's not about the one, the common ones that we usually talk about. And one that I'm very interested in exploring is sexual dysfunction in women with Parkinson's disease. Sexual dysfunction is an important aspect of Parkinson's in general in men and women. However, for many years, the women aspects of the disease has been neglected. And we don't know much, for instance, about how menstrual cycles, hormonal therapy, pregnancy, and other women's health aspect can influence the disease. Particularly with se sexual dysfunction in women with Parkinson's, there's very little known. And we recently conducted a very extensive review of all the literature out there that will uh, mention sexual dysfunction in Parkinson's disease. And we found out that of the 40 articles that focus on sexual dysfunction in Parkinson's, only two of them speak particularly about women. And the information is very, very variable. So some articles report that sexual dysfunction in women it goes very is very unfrequent to 3% of the people of the women affected with Parkinson's suffering these problems or up to 90%. And uh, however we know from our experience that some women with Parkinson's may have loss of sexual interest, reduce uh, or uh, like ability to reach an orgasm, or also difficulties, for instance, with mild incontinence during the sexual intercourse. So we really feel we need to learn more about these aspects that have such a significant impact of women with Parkinson's. Uh, so we are planning to uh, conduct a study this summer to understand this aspect a bit more. What is interesting to also mention about sexual dysfunction is that physicians sometimes do not feel comfortable asking about these aspects. And patients also feel that it's a bit awkward if the doctor doesn't ask about it to bring it to the consult. But if you are experiencing this type of symptoms, it's very important for you to talk to your doctor about it because there are maybe many tips or strategies that your neurologist may recommend to improve this important aspect of life. As Dr. Martino mentioned, I also have an interest in very advanced disease. This means patients that have had the disease for 20 or more years that are experiencing symptoms uh, of what we call advanced disease, as I mentioned before, like some maybe cognitive impairment, some issues with falls, some issues with swallowing function that may or may not happen. But for those patients who want to make sure we have good strategies to also help and improve their lives, there are three aspects um, that we're working at. One is an integrated model of care. Um, one is palliative care, like how to help our patients go through the latest stages of the disease in the best possible way. And also, I want to be present for my patients by the end of their life. So we're working on a lot in developing a good program to help our patients and their care partners in the process. Um, one of the in main areas of my, my, one of my main areas of interest in this aspect is care partners. Uh, we call uh, them in this publication that is going to be uh, published, The Invisible Patients, because we know that care partners of patients with Parkinson's disease are more prone to have uh, depression, anxiety, hypertension, diabetes. And we want to try to help uh, that risk to be reduced. 
We also know that we work in Canada, where we have in, in people from all over the world who had who were fortunate as myself to come here as immigrants. So we thought it would be very important to understand the cultural differences in care partnerships to try to understand people in a targeted way and reviewing everything again that is outside uh, in the literature about care partners and cultural difference, we find very interesting differences in how people are affected when they take uh, with their care partners with someone with Parkinson's disease. And we are planning to introduce all this important knowledge into our next interventions. Coming soon, Calgary will have uh, the Movement Disorders Palliative Care Program, not just for Parkinson's, but for, for any patient that has led for many, many years with a Parkinsonism or an atypical Parkinsonian syndrome and could need our help. And this is going to be an interdisciplinary team working with the patient and the family to improve quality of life to the maximum possible way. This has also been going on in Edmonton for many years. In fact, Dr. Miyazaki, who was my mentor, was the first one uh, in Canada um, introducing this type of care for people with Parkinson's disease. So I'm pretty sure you know her well. Uh, so I have been uh, fortunately enough to be able to try to reproduce the experience in Edmonton here in Calgary. And again, there are many other things that we are uh, going through, uh, we are trying to understand if how our patients use, use cannabis and uh, improve our communication with patients about cannabis use, potential indications, uh, to see if we can guide our patients in the process instead of being something that runs completely independently of our movement disorders clinic. We're trying to understand how some of the non-motor symptoms that I have mentioned affect other aspects of life, just as decision making. We're working with Dr. Martino and other team members, understanding pain in other movement disorders, such as dystonia, and trying to understand pain in a typical Parkinsonian syndrome, such as progressive supranuclear palsy or multiple system atrophy too, and also in some other movement disorders like n syndrome. All this work is possible because I have an excellent, huge, team and multiple collaborations across Calgary, Alberta, and Canada include, and also some international ones, including Parkinson's Association of Alberta and a particular wonderful group of patients always willing to participate, help, support my research. So uh, I'm extremely grateful. And as well as that, I want to thank you all for this opportunity um, to discuss my research with you. I will be open to any questions. I didn't want to over like to put everything in there because I know that it's a lot of information. But if you feel that any of these projects um, it's related with something that you are experiencing and you would like to learn more about any of those, uh, please email us, uh, my two research assistants, Beatrice and Parisa, will be happy to chat about everything that we have uh, running right now. And if anything suits you, we'll be happy to give you more information. Remember, again, we have many more research projects here in Calgary going on. Not all of them uh, on are mine. There are many other interesting uh, research projects right now. So, um, uh, feel free to contact our clinic and we will provide more information. And thank you very much again for this great opportunity. Thank you very much, Veronica, for this great talk and for outlining so passionately all the work, fantastic work you've been doing. And uh, uh, yeah, really exciting. And uh, I'm sure there will be uh, lots of questions and points of discussion, um, but we will, uh, defer them to um, this after the second presentation of today. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I'm really um, uh, very excited to present to you uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Raylin Brassard, who is a, a PhD candidate. And it's great to hear uh, the excellent work that uh, graduate students are currently doing in uh, 
uh, in um, in Alberta, and we're moving for this uh, to the University of Alberta. Uh, Raylin is a candidate in the lab of Dr. Joanne Lemieux, um, and she is currently working at the Department of Biochemistry uh, and uh, at the University of Alberta. She has uh, um, studied um, uh, and is studying um, under the supervision of Dr. Lemieux. Um, a, the mitochondrial uh, rhomboid protease PARL. Mitochondria are a crucial uh, um, cell organelle uh, in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease. And uh, indeed, Raylin will be presenting today on, uh, uh, on her investigations of the impact of one of the uh, genetic causes of uh, um, early onset Parkinson's disease, which is uh, the pink one uh, gene variants, which are tightly linked to the function of the mitochondria. Uh, so this is an opportunity to understand uh, uh, what exciting uh, research in the uh, cellular and molecular mechanisms of Parkinson's disease uh, is happening in our province, and in particular, uh, mechanisms that will certainly provide useful, very important insight on uh, future uh, interventions. So without further ado, again, I'll leave the floor to Raylin for her presentation. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, um, Dr. Martino, for that introduction. Um, and a big thank you to the Parkinson's Association of Alberta for having me um, present today some of my research. And so, um, my supervisor, Dr. Joanne Lemieux, is um, sorry she couldn't be here today um, to give this presentation for you. Um, but as a graduate student in her lab, I am very honored to be able to share some of my work with you. And so, like Dr. Martino said, I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit on um, the pink one protein, which is a mitochondrial protein, and its role in um, early onset Parkinson's disease. And so I don't want to spend too much time going into the um, symptoms, um, the range of symptoms that Parkinson's disease patients can have, as Dr. Bruno just gave us um, a great range of all the both motor and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease patients. But I want to focus on a smaller subset of young onset or early onset Parkinson's disease patients. And while the um, average age of onset of Parkinson's is about 60 years old, these patients can begin um, exhibiting symptoms and be diagnosed with the disease as early as 20 to 50 years old. And so um, these patients, um, while they still exhibit um, the typical motor symptoms um, and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, they tend to have a slower progression of the disease, um, but have more side effects from the dopaminergic um, medications that are typically used to treat Parkinson's and have more frequent cramping um, and some of the postural abnormalities that Dr. Bruno was speaking about. So these patients with young onset Parkinson's disease have what's known as a familial form of the disease. And so what does that mean exactly? Well, Parkinson's disease can be either sporadic or familial. And for most people with Parkinson's disease, about 90%, this is a sporadic form of the disease that's caused by a combination of environmental risk factors and genetic predisposition or risk factors. But with early onset or familial forms of the disease, the genetics play a larger role in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease. And so scientists have identified um, numerous mutations encoding genes um, in these early onset Parkinson's disease patients. And this is including um, alpha-synuclein, which is a common um, protein I'm sure many of you have heard of in relation to Parkinson's but also Parkin or PINK1, um, which interestingly are mitochondrial proteins that I'll spend more of my talk here focusing on. And so we know that Parkinson's disease results from a loss of the dopamine producing neurons in the substantia nigra of the brain, which is the smallest portion of the midbrain here. And many of the medications and current treatments focus on treating um, the symptoms through dopamine um, agonists. However, what is causing this loss of the dopamine producing neurons has always been um, a question in the field that um, scientists have been investigating. And I 
would like to focus more on the mitochondrial aspects of this um, disease and how these contribute to the death of these dopaminergic neurons. So I quite like this figure that focuses on um, how both the sporadic and the familial forms of Parkinson's disease can be linked back to the mitochondria. And so, like I mentioned, sporadic forms can be from a combination of environmental factors as well as genetic risk, risk factors. And these can also be linked back to mitochondrial function as um, some environmental factors such as um, the toxin rotenone, which is, um, or used to be commonly used in pesticides, actually inhibits energy production in the mitochondria. So like I mentioned, there are um, numerous genes in the mitochondria, such as Parkin, PINK1, which will be the focus of my talk today, and DJ1, which have been identified to have mutations in early onset Parkinson's disease patients that play key roles in the quality control and the energy production in the mitochondria. And so when we learn about the mitochondria um, in our science classes and in university, they're depicted um, as shown here, get my laser pointer out, as these kind of little kidney beans um, is what we are used to seeing them as. And this is true, but it's quite deceiving as we always think of one or two, four little kidney beans floating around in our cell as our big energy producers. But what you can see, if you look here at this figure on the right, this is a microscopy picture I took in some human cells where, you, where I stained the mitochondria. And we can see that it's actually this really long elongated network uh, that spans the entire cell. And these mitochondria can actually fuse together and they exchange their components. And so um, they do have these double membrane walls that we see here, but it's a little more complicated than what we originally um, learn about. And so hopefully this video here will work. Ooh, maybe not. Shoot, sorry. Um, what I wanted to show you is that these mitochondria are able to fuse together and come apart. And this dynamic motion of our mitochondria is crucial for its ability to create the energy required for our cells. And so the fission or the ability of these mitochondria to separate into two is actually crucial for its ability to remove any mitochondria that becomes damaged from the cell. Oh, now here it's finally going to come in. That's okay. We'll just give it. Um, but it's just important to know that these organelles are actually very dynamic and they're always undergoing this fusion and fission that's required to create this energy dynamic in the cell. Sorry, my screen seems to be frozen. There we go. So how do the cells know that the mitochondria might be damaged and needs to be removed? And well, this is through this protein called PINK1. And so this is quite an interesting protein, um, but here it is depicted in pink here, of course. And what happens is this protein gets brought in through this big machinery in the mitochondrial membranes. And this, barrel segment of the protein sits in the inner membrane and it meets these, this protein called PARL, which is a, a protease in the lab. I like to call them molecular scissors. These proteins are responsible for chopping up other proteins in the cell. And so PARL actually cuts up the pink one protein in this barrel, and then it allows the rest of the protein to get released back and get broken down in the cell. And so when the mitochondria is healthy, Pink one's always just kind of getting um, chopped up and turned over. But importantly, when pink one, um, when the mitochondria, sorry, becomes damaged, this machinery no longer allows the pink one protein to get imported. And so pink one kind of accumulates on the mitochondria. So I like to think of it as the mitochondria waving a little red flag or a little pink flag saying, I'm damaged, I need to be removed. And so once this pink one starts to accumulate on the membrane, it um, triggers a series of events um, through Parkin, which if you recall was one of the other genes that can be mutated in Parkinson's disease. 
And this causes some signaling that allows this mitochondria specifically to be broken down and taken away so that the damaged mitochondria don't build up in the cell. And so this is a really important protein in acting as a sensor of the health of the mitochondria uh, and flagging it for destruction. And so this protein is so important because we require a balance of our mitochondria um, damage and removal to maintain those energetic needs of the cell. And so um, this picture here on the top shows that in a healthy normal individual, the amount of damage of the mitochondria needs to be equal to the removal of the mitochondria. However, in Parkinson's disease patients, we can have one of a few scenarios where there's excessive damage to our mitochondria, those critical energy producing organelles, and the removal is not sufficient from the cell. And so that damage begins to build up. Or on the other hand, the amount of damage could be the same, but mutations in some of these proteins could impair that machinery needed to remove these damaged mitochondria. And again, they're gonna start building up in the cell. Or, which I hope I can convince you of um, by the end of my talk this afternoon, it's possible that there's mutations in the machinery that can remove more than what is damaged in the mitochondria. And so now we're losing our mitochondria and so we're having less energy produced. And so it's crucial that we have a balance of these processes. And so this figure is slightly overwhelming. So don't worry too much about the numbers and the letters here. But what I just wanted to show you is that this is a schematic of that pink one protein. And each of these points here is a mutation that's been identified in an early onset or young onset Parkinson's disease patient. So you can see there's over 100 mutations in this protein that have been identified. And so this really just highlights how crucial this protein is in maintaining that integrity of the mitochondrial network, and maintaining the energy supply needed for our neuronal tissues. And so because there's so, so, so many in this protein, I'm just gonna focus in here for the sake of this talk on three mutations that are clustered around where those molecular scissors parl cuts. Because our lab focuses a lot on these protease proteins, we were interested in how these mutations that cluster so close to where pink one gets cut would affect um, the cleavage or the cutting by this parl protease. And so the first thing we wanted to do was check to see how these mutations affect how the pink one protein gets into the mitochondria. Do they still get there? How does that look? And so we can do this using some imaging techniques in cells. And so what we do is if we focus here on the top panel, we can look at um, different components of the cell labeled with different um, fluorescent or color markers, and then image the same cell with these different colors and see, overlay them and see where our protein of interest is in the cell. So this first one here just shows the cell membrane where the boundary of our cell is. And then here I've stained that mitochondrial network like I showed you before. And then we can look in this normal pink one, wild type here just means the unmutated form of the protein. And we can see it's present in the outside of the cell and the boundaries of the cell, as well as in the mitochondria. And so this is depictive of that healthy mitochondria that we looked at before, where pink one is coming in and gets cut and leaves. So it's kind of all over the cell. And we look at the mutation at position 92, we see a similar distribution where it's in both the mitochondria and the cell. But we see an interesting um, mitochondrial localization when we look at the mutation of this arginine at position 98. And so just this single um, substitution in the code caused the pink one protein to really get stuck in the mitochondria. We can see it's no longer very present in the rest of the cell. And so this was quite interesting and reminded us of when a mitochondria becomes damaged and pink one is accumulating on the mitochondria. So we thought, hmm, what is going on here? And finally, this um, mutation at position 111, again, we see a similar distribution to the normal pink one. And while these images are um, nice and fun, we need to be able to put some numbers to these. And so we can quantify this. And in this graph, we can see there seems to be three times more of this, um, of the mitochondria pink one with this mutation at position 98. 
So we thought this must not be getting cleaved by those molecular scissors. And that's why it seems to be getting stuck in the mitochondria. And I don't wanna to spend too much time on this for a sake of time, but we're able to use a process called a Western blot, which simply put just means I can break open a cell and run my protein out on a gel. And this gel has a fine meshing that allows me to separate the fragments by size. So the larger pieces run slower. So I have my full form of the protein here and then the cut portion down lower. And we can see with our normal pink one, we can see equal amounts of the fragments. But if I use a drug that's called CCCP, that's gonna stop the machinery from letting pink one into the mitochondria, I can see I get more of that big full length. And we see a similar, again, with the cysteine um, 92 mutation. But if we focus in again at this mutation at position 98, we can see, again, we're getting this buildup of pink one, like we saw in the images. But it does seem that this cleaved portion is still present. So it does seem like this protein is being cut. So this was really interesting to us. And for the sake of time, I won't go too much into this, but we can also take a protein that we've made in the cell. So we can make PARL in a bacteria and purify it. And then we can measure how well that cuts both the normal pink one and the mutated pink one. And again, what we find is that this mutation does not impair the ability to get cleaved. And so we can look at how efficiently this protein gets cut by the protease. And we see that it's relatively the same. There's no statistical difference between how well it gets cut. And so if we take these pieces of data together, of those three mutations that I showed you in that area surrounding the cleavage site by those molecular scissors, only this mutation at position 98 seem to show some altered processing of this um, in the mitochondria. And we saw that in the confocal pictures that it was really building up in the mitochondria. But from my other assays, it seems that it is being cleaved in fact. And so what we think is happening is that despite it being cleaved, this mutation is causing interactions that get it, force it to get stuck. And so it's still gonna trigger those signaling cascades that are gonna to lead to the depletion or the, the removal of that mitochondria, even though otherwise this mitochondria is healthy. And so what's gonna happen is we're gonna get this imbalance here that we see at the bottom where the damage is not um, being increased, but the removal of our mitochondrial network is being depleted. And so we have excess removal and we're gonna start losing those critical energy producing organelles in our cell. And so, why is this important? This is one mutation. What is going on here? Well, studying these specific mutations and linking um, back how these um, proteins function in the mitochondria to contribute to the disease allows us um, to have more personalized medicine, but it also gives us more insight into the neuroscience and the molecular mechanism between what is happening before the death of those dopaminergic neurons. And so now there are clinical trials where they are using um, substances to enhance the mitochondrial function of the cell to try and alleviate the death of those dopaminergic neurons before they start dying so that we're no longer just treating the symptom, but trying to get it a step earlier before those neurons actually start dying. And so again, this brings us back to the idea of personalized medicine and how far it's coming. And now, um, when we can look and find these mutations in patients, we can now separate them out and treat them more specifically um, based on their environmental and their genetic factors. And so I hope I didn't go through fa too fast with that, but I just um, wanted to thank again, the Parkinson Association of Alberta um, for the opportunity to present today, but also for the funding they provided our lab through the years. Um, and importantly, the Neuroscience and Mental Health Institute, along with the Brad Mates Foundation um, for funding my work. And then um, of course, my lab members, especially Dr. Lemieux, who's the leader of our lab. And um, this is just a small fraction of collaborators we have here at the University of Alberta. And thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. 
Thank you very much, Raleen. Thank you for uh, making this uh, uh, difficult topic sound so easy to comprehend and uh, it's a great job. Um, I believe now that Declan will uh, open up the floor for uh, a Q&A moment. We don't have a lot of time, I can see, so maybe Declan, you have Yes, so we've got, uh, we do have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, so we'll jump right into it. We've got one question um, for you, Dr. Bruno. Uh, it goes, hello, great talk, challenging work. Have you involved safinamide in your work for pain or other symptoms? If so, any thoughts? I see it heavily, it's, I see it seems heavily promoted and I find the suppression of glutamate the most interesting part but that mode of action remains highly theoretical, I read. Um, so any thoughts on safinamide and pain? Uh, yes, so there, there has been some work, not mine, but in the past for about like MAUB inhibitors in general, but safinamide in particular for pain. It's very preliminary data. Uh, so basically they review the studies that were done to when the drug was approved and look at uh, one particular question of the quality of life scales that is about pain or body discomfort. Um, and uh, they found some improvement. This was probably related with the reductions, mild reduction in the fluctuations in the on and off periods. So it's an alternative that could be tried in patients with fluctuation related pain um, in when we try to optimize dopaminergic therapies in general. Um, in terms of the glutamate um, a suppression effect, um, there's, there's I, I don't think that would lead into any effect on pain directly. Um, but yes, I agree that that remains mostly theoretical for now until we get to know more about the track and the way it works. Great, thank you for addressing that. Um, we've also just got a couple comments here um, for Ray Lin, fascinating detective work. Thanks for being interested in this research. And then a big thank you to both presenters for sharing complex research information in an understandable manner. I think we are coming up on one o'clock here um, in about one minute. So I will um, read the, the closing remarks and then um, we will be on our way for today. Um, so thank you to Dr. David Martino for taking the time to join us uh, and moderate today's webinar. And thank you to both our presenters, Dr. Veronica Bruno and, and Raylin Brassard for sharing your knowledge. And thank you to everyone who was able to attend live and share your questions. We hope you will join us at our next scheduled Lunch and Learn webinar this Wednesday at noon, featuring four young research students, as our theme will continue to be Parkinson Association's contribution uh, to the research community in Alberta. Registration is free, and you can do so through our website, parkinsonassociation.ca. All webinars will be shared on our YouTube channel and website as well. So thank you for attending, and we will wrap things up there. Thank you.